the height of the 18th century, the most glorious kingdom in Europe would face a mighty foe, the power of its own people. One man would rise to inspire the nation, to cast aside a reluctant king and a hated queen. And a new republic would be born in blood, the blood of the French Revolution. In 1794, France's conciergerie prison, an impenetrable fortress on the banks of the Seine River. Dank, rat-infested, it is known as death's antechamber. Inside, the voice of a young nation is about to be silenced. As his hair is shorn and his neck laid bare for the blade of the guillotine, Maximilien Robespierre prepares to pay for the cataclysm left in his wake the explosion of events that became the French Revolution. The French Revolution is this extraordinary moment when people began to believe that you could actually recreate almost everything in a society, that you could not only change the politics, the institutions, but you could change human nature itself through political action. The French Revolution really does constitute the crossroads of the modern world where everything begins to turn in a different direction. The revolution saw a feudal land turn its back on aristocratic tradition and chart a violent new course for the future. It would shake the very foundation of Europe and its impact would be felt across the seas. The French Revolution is the most important event in Western history. There are developments that can rival it, like the Industrial Revolution, like capitalism, but if you mean an event, I can't think of anything more important. It was the revolution that upset things the most. I mean, again, when you consider that it got rid of the Catholic Church, it got rid of Christianity, it got rid of the nobility, it got rid of the king, it got rid of all these things. The French Revolution would bring bread to the poor, democracy to France, and would establish a whole new order of society. But progress would come at a price really a moment of extraordinary hope, extraordinary ambition, and then it turned into this most horrific tragedy. Now, broken and defeated, Robespierre, not two days before, stood atop his world, presiding over the greatest and bloodiest revolution Europe had ever known. So true to its ideals, he was called the incorruptible. So powerful, his slightest utterance could cloak an entire city in fear. A master orator, Robespierre's words were his weapon. Now, silenced by a bullet to the jaw, he awaits the same swift and brutal end he has brought down upon so many others. The revolution is about to eat its own. No one could have foreseen the turbulent times ahead on one spring day in 1770. The Chateau of Versailles fills to its gilded rafters with the glittering crowds of the royal court. Completed in 1682, Versailles was the crowning masterpiece of King Louis XIV. To put some distance between himself and his subjects, Louis XIV transplanted the capital of France to this small town 12 miles west of Paris where he had built the most magnificent palace in all of Europe. For nearly 100 years, it has been the seat of the nation's unwavering monarchy. And today, it is host to a very important wedding. King Louis XV's grandson, Prince Louis Capet, next in line for the throne, is about to take a bride. Just 15 years old on the eve of his wedding, Louis Capet is bashful and hesitant, with few of the characteristics expected of a future king, much less a husband. Louis was this pudgy, shy, painfully inadequate 15-year-old with absolutely no social graces at all. Louis XV's mistress, Madame du Barry, called him a fat, ill-bred boy. Basically, he was just a schlub. It was very hard for Louis to come to 
decisions. He dithered incessantly. He was always ready to be persuaded by the last person he had talked to. Again, those are usually not considered good leadership qualities. Louis's marriage is a political union between Austria's royal family, the Habsburgs, and his own, the Bourbons. The wedding symbolizes the end of an ancient rivalry and the beginning of new regional ties. The young bride-to-be arrives in France, a wide-eyed and pretty 14-year-old girl, Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette is an Archduchess of Austria. She's the youngest daughter of the Empress Maria Theresa. And she comes to France as part of a marriage deal which represents a great reversal of alliances whereby for the first time in living memory, France and Austria become allies rather than enemies. Marie comes to France as a political gesture, but as a teenager, she has little interest in political affairs. Well, when Marie Antoinette came to Versailles, she was very young. She didn't know a great deal about the country she was coming to. She didn't know about the customs. She didn't know about the court. She was certainly a headstrong girl, a very lively girl, um, but she was still a girl. When Marie Antoinette comes to Versailles, she is just a teenager. She is blonde with blue eyes. She is pretty, and she likes being attractive to people. And she comes with the intention of winning over her husband and her new family. On the night of the wedding, there is an ominous storm. But inside, the grandeur of the ceremony lights up the palace as the newlyweds make their way to the royal bedroom. In an age-old ceremony to encourage the conception of an heir, the king's courtiers are present as the awkward young couple is revealed in the marriage bed for the first time. The crowd is delighted and expectations are high. But once the curtains are drawn, it's clear that an heir will not be so easily produced. Louis was not only not interested in ruling, Louis wasn't particularly interested in loving either. And he paid her no attention on the first nights uh, or even further into their marriage. Many years will pass before the marriage is finally consummated. The lack of an heir will soon spark gossip all across the kingdom that will continue to plague the couple for years to come. The grand wedding gala continues for days. But outside the gates of Versailles, there is hardly cause for celebration. Years of mismanagement by the monarchy have left the French people deprived and hungry. Nearly a decade earlier, King Louis XV lost the Seven Years' War, battling Great Britain over territory in North America. The ill-fated conflict all but bankrupted France of money and prestige, leaving the country's coffers drained even as its population is growing bigger every day. With diseases like the plague at distant memory, fewer people are dying, but more and more of them are hungry. France grew from 20 million to 26 million in the 18th century after having grown only 1 million in the preceding two centuries. That put tremendous strain on what was there, and so there was a lot of anxiety. Four years after the royal wedding, Prince Louis's grandfather loses his final battle with smallpox. Louis XV dies a defeated and unpopular king and leaves behind a country on the brink of chaos. In a lavish ceremony, young Prince Louis inherits the throne and is crowned King Louis XVI. Despite his insistence on a grandiose coronation, Louis is all too aware that he is woefully unprepared for the job. Louis XVI, the moment his grandfather dies and it suddenly is clear that he's king, he doesn't know what to do. He feels as if the world is falling in upon him. So although he's been educated in the full expectation of becoming king, he doesn't feel ready for it. For a kingdom in crisis, Louis XVI is the worst man to have on the watch. The 20-year-old king prays, protect us, Lord, for we reign too young. 
Ensconced in their royal apartments in Versailles, Louis and Marie begin their promising new lives as young monarchs, while only 12 miles away in the city of Paris, another new era is dawning, one that is on a collision course with the monarchy itself. It is a dangerous new age of ideas, the age of enlightenment. As the royal carriage approaches the esteemed Louis Le Grand College, crowds gather for a glimpse of grandeur. It is the day to welcome the newly crowned king, Louis XVI, and his lovely Austrian wife to the city of Paris. And at the head of the welcome party is a promising young law student, Maximilien Robespierre. When Robespierre was a schoolboy, the king visited the college and Robespierre gave a Latin address to the king. So he actually spoke to Louis XVI when he was a teenager. As Robespierre respectfully delivers his Latin soliloquy, the king hardly notices the boy. But years later, their fates will again intertwine under very different, much darker circumstances. It was one of these rituals that take place in every school, and yet, of course, it was so charged with irony, because here you had the young Robespierre reading this discourse in honor of the man he would later kill. For now, the welcome is warm and the flattery sincere. The visit from the royals may have won the hearts of the people, but their minds are leaning increasingly in an entirely different direction. Since the Middle Ages, European society had been broken into three distinct classes, dictated by birth. There was a great divide between the wealth of the nobility and the clergy and the poverty of the peasants. Then, at the blossoming of the 18th century, reason and science began to challenge this age-old tradition. Swept up on a current of innovation and new literature, Paris now radiates as the philosophical center of the world. The city pulses with a great flourishing of knowledge, a shining beacon of possibility. It is the Age of Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is a movement which says don't trust authority, don't trust anything that you've been told by anybody else at all, think it out for yourself, test it for yourself. In old regime Europe, you were told what to think. You were given information from above by your rulers, by your priests. And so the idea that you could map out all of human knowledge and then have access to it was revolutionary. In elite salons across Paris, aristocrats gather to discuss Enlightenment authors and the burgeoning age of reason. Voltaire, Rousseau, fresh voices who champion liberty, control of one's own destiny, and above all, equality. The passion for this new literature is highest among the upper class, but as Enlightenment ideas take root at all levels of society, the drive for equality will begin to threaten the aristocratic way of life. What makes it dangerous is it means you will eventually question why are aristocrats the ones with privilege? Can't we change the world to make it a better place? Isn't progress possible? All of that will eventually undermine the idea that monarchy is natural, aristocracy is natural, and hierarchy is natural. To see Enlightenment ideals in action, one need only look across the Atlantic, where the Americans are fighting for freedom from France's old nemesis, Great Britain. Young King Louis wants revenge for his grandfather's defeats, and he sees an opportunity in the American War of Independence. Louis commits to the cause a total of 2,000 million livres, enough to feed and house 7 million French citizens for a year. His investment would mark the beginning of financial collapse for France. America bankrupts France, in effect, because the debt which the French monarchy incurs in order to fight the American War of Independence 
turns out to be absolutely crucial in the financial situation of the French monarchy because the French monarchy cannot pay those debts. While Louis sends money and troops across the Atlantic, Marie is busy incurring debts of her own. Life at Versailles is a never-ending routine of archaic ritual and formality. There are ceremonies for the waking of the king and queen, for dressing, for dining, for retiring to bed. To keep herself amused amidst the ritual drudgery, Marie Antoinette presides over a parade of increasingly outrageous fashions. Marie was obsessed with fashion, especially these towering hairdos that were several feet high that took hours and hours in the construction and fit all sorts of ornaments and fruits and to many people they seemed like an obscenity. They came to represent what was all, all that was wrong with her and with Versailles and that culture. Marie occupies herself with court gossip, gambling and the staging of plays. As her expenses accumulate, Marie earns the nickname Madame Deficit. Marie is given the name Madame Deficit as the country is in economic chaos. And she continues to spend as if nothing's happened on dresses and jewels and shoes. And she was the Imelda Marcos of her day. Of all the debts Marie incurs, the greatest is what she owes her country, an heir to the throne. In the seven years since their marriage, Louis and Marie have yet to produce a child. Marie finds herself in an increasingly humiliating position. The job of the Queen is to produce a male heir. It's absolutely essential for there to be a son. And during that time, uh, people criticize, people are dissatisfied, people say the king should never have married this Austrian archduchess, and now she can't even produce an heir to the throne. Marie is desperate. Louis' appetite for food is unquestioned, but sex is clearly not on the menu. Il y a toute une correspondance entre l'ambassadeur d'Autriche Marie Therese, the mother of Marie Antoinette, questioned, if a girl as gorgeous as my daughter cannot get him going, then what is going on? Louis XVI and his young wife were not able to conceive for seven years. This cast a pall on the beginning of his reign, and because his hobby as a locksmith was well known, uh, there were all sorts of salacious songs uh, circulating to the effect that the locksmith was having a hard time finding the keyhole. Louis' disinterest in sex is seen as a lack of bravado as a king. Finally, after years of frustration and pressure from the court, Louis is diagnosed with a treatable condition called phimosis. Louis had a deformity that made arousal extremely painful. Therefore, there was no consummation until there was a surgical procedure that could correct this. But he was scared to death to have it. And it took years for him to agree to have it. And when he finally did, uh, voila. <coughs> After a simple surgery, the couple is able to have their first child, Marie Therese. But there is no easy fix for the years of damage to Marie's image. Since the early 1780s, libelles have circulated throughout the country, pornographic satire of the king and queen. Obscene pamphlets mock Louis' impotence and portray Marie as a promiscuous harlot in a debauched and decadent court. The people's view of the monarchy sours as conditions in the countryside worsen. After a succession of bad harvests, deregulation has raised the cost of flour, leading to a shortage of the very heart of the French diet, bread. But the hardships naturally stop at the gates of Versailles. As the royals continue to live in extravagance, Complaints are committed to paper. One charge is leveled directly at the royal court. Do you know why there are so many needy people? It is because your luxurious existence devours in one day the substance of a thousand men. The man behind this charge? The same young man who just a few years earlier regaled the king and queen after their coronation. Maximilien Robespierre. 
In Robespierre, the people will soon gain a voice calling for liberty, equality, for revolution. Versailles in the late 1700s is an oasis of extravagance, surrounded by a land in despair. And with an uncertain king at the helm, France is charting a course for disaster. After 19 years of marriage, Louis has sired four children. Yet as a king, he remains impotent. In an attempt to demonstrate leadership, Louis dabbles in financial reforms. But his misguided interfering burdens the poor with heavy taxes, while the nobility pay hardly at all. With the economy in ruins and the people restless, it seems as if even the heavens are angry, smiting France with the most bitterly cold winter in 90 years. If ever God intervened to make a situation worse, the summer of 1788 and the spring of 1789 is a moment when that happens. By the summer of 1788, you already have a burgeoning political crisis, and it's developing against the background of very serious food shortage. For the people of France in the 18th century, flour is the essence of life itself. Bread the measure of existence. Most ordinary people in France ate at least two pounds a day of bread. Bread was all important. Its price was immediately felt by everyone. If the price doubled, you were in big trouble. Under Louis' financial mismanagement, the cost of flour skyrockets. Sparse food supplies are hoarded. The cost of a loaf of bread soon equals a month's earnings. Hunger turns to rage. Riots break out across France. Homes are robbed. Bakeries are raided. And shopkeepers suspected of stockpiling bread are lynched on the spot. With the economy in shambles, the banks force Louis to hire a finance minister, Jacques Necker. An enlightened thinker, Necker is popular with the people in a way that Louis can only envy. Jacques Necker was undoubtedly the most popular minister throughout the spring of 89 because he's taken the line publicly in his writings that the government's duty is to make sure that there is enough bread and grain for everybody. The nation in fiscal crisis, Necker urges Louis to call a meeting of the traditional representative body of the kingdom, the Estates General. It is the first time the representatives have been called together in 175 years. France was politically organized in something called the estates. The first estate was the clergy, the second estate was the nobility, and the third estate was everyone else. And by a contemporary reckoning, the first two estates uh, occupied 3% of the population, and the third estate 97% of the population. A lot of people felt it was very unfair for this third estate, which was most of the population, to only have one-third of the deputies. They felt it was very unfair that this should be a three-chamber parliament, where two chambers, the nobility and the clergy, could always outvote the commoners. May 4th, 1789. A skilled young lawyer and politician arrives at Versailles. Maximilien Robespierre comes to stand before the Estates General as a deputy to fight for a fair voice for the people he represents, the Third Estate. An orphan from the provinces, Robespierre had risen to academic prominence on a prestigious scholarship, becoming an eloquent speaker, prim in appearance, with never a hair nor a phrase out of place. Back home in the small town of Arras, the Enlightenment ideas he had absorbed in the salons of Paris found a powerful voice as he became a hometown lawyer for the downtrodden. By the time he went back and started to practice as a lawyer, he was reading very widely in the Enlightenment. And Robespierre was someone who, when he was practicing law in Arras, tried to actually bring the ideas of the Enlightenment into the cases he was fighting. At the Estates General, 
Robespierre and his colleagues are demanding that the nobility and clergy pay taxes, but Louis feels increasingly threatened by the growing radicalism of the Third Estate. Then, on June 20th, after a six-week deadlock, the deputies arrive to find that they are being silenced. On June 20th, when the deputies come to their meeting and find the doors locked, they suspect a plot. They move next door to what we call a tennis court, which was really a handball court, and gather together and swear they will not stop meeting until they have a new constitution. The deputies declare themselves a new national assembly, the true representatives of the people of France. The tennis court oath is one of these great symbolic moments in the history of the French Revolution. You had these people assembled in this great open space of the tennis court, raising their arms in this sort of quasi-Roman salute. And for the National Assembly, this was a moment when they realized something of their power and their dignity and saw that they really could defy France's king. In one revolutionary stand of defiance, the National Assembly is born. It will be a communion of voices from around the country, a parliamentary body enacting the people's will. But wresting power from the king would not be so easy as signing a simple proclamation. All of these early victories that take place at Versailles are largely paper victories, and they have no teeth to back them up. And the fear that it happens that it takes over the deputies at Versailles as we approach July, mid-July is that the king is gathering his forces to disperse them, to overthrow them. By early July, 30,000 of the king's troops are taking positions around Paris. To defend themselves, the people form a new national guard. Rioters raid Paris's armories and make away with over 28,000 muskets. The only thing missing is gunpowder the people know just where to get it. In the center of Paris, there looms a massive stone dungeon, notorious as a symbol of feudal rule, the Bastille. The prison houses the city's stores of gunpowder and is legendary as a den of torture and unspeakable deaths. The Bastille had been the great symbol of royal despotism, the great symbol of the kings of France running beyond the just limits of their own power, a symbol of horror for the people of France. Amidst the rioting, there is a stunning outrage. Louis fires his finance minister, the people's beloved Jacques Necker, seen as too sympathetic to the masses. Hours after Necker is fired, word reaches Paris that their man on the inside has been ousted. There is nothing left but revolt. On July 14th, crowds band together identifying themselves with a small cockade, red and blue for the colors of Paris, separated by white, the color of the House of Bourbon. The tricolor is born. From the feverish crowd, a voice cries out to the Bastille. Attacking the Bastille means that the people of Paris are saying, you cannot get rid of the new National Assembly. The people are acting, they're arming themselves, and they're basically saying, we take the side of the revolution. At the sight of the approaching mob, the governor of the Bastille, Bernard de Launay, attempts to lock down the prison. He mounts a hopeless defense and the marauders storm the fortress and tear into the guards with knives and pikes. Finally, Delaunay surrenders, but the enraged mob engulfs him, dragging him through the streets. The jeering horde kicks and stabs at him until he shouts, let me die. The crowd eagerly obliges. He is stabbed and shot, and a revolutionary tradition is born. His severed head is paraded on a pike. The deputies in the National Assembly do not immediately condemn this act of violence. In fact, they accept it. And it was this acceptance of uh, popular violence that, in some people's view, uh, created a pattern that was to have catastrophic consequences for uh, the unfolding of the revolution. With the smoke still clearing over the Bastille, 
Louis XVI returns from a hunting trip. In his diary, under the date July 14, 1789, he writes, Nothing. A reference to his unsuccessful hunt. An aide interrupts and breaks the news of the riots and the fall of the Bastille. Louis XVI asks, Is it a revolt? No, sire, he replies. It is a revolution. the Bastille unleashes the irrepressible torrent of revolution. The people had defied their king and won. There would be no turning back. As a symbol of the defeat of tyranny, the people, men, women and children, dig in with bare hands and tear the Bastille apart, brick by feudal brick. They are beginning to dismantle the past itself. The French went about the process of tearing down the Bastille as quickly as they could. In the absence of powerful explosives, this was done very painstakingly, but with a tremendous amount of vigor. And the bricks were given away, sold as emblems of the demolition of despotism. The energy of the streets invigorates the National Assembly. A charter is penned within days called the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Under this daring new document, archaic class distinctions are to be abolished and all men considered truly equal. The Declaration of the Rights of Men was a declaration promulgated by the National Assembly which said in its text that the sovereignty belongs to the people, belongs to the nation. The king is nowhere mentioned in this document. Therefore, by issuing this document, the Assembly was effectively seizing power for itself. With the new National Assembly as their voice, the citizens of France set out to change the very fabric of their world. They demand a constitutional monarchy, equal rights for all men, and justice under reasonable laws. To provide a greater voice for the call of revolution, Robespierre demands increased freedom for the press, long muzzled under the old regime. The resulting free press is spearheaded by l'Ami du Peuple, the people's friend. A fiery newspaper full of vitriolic rants and provocation. It is the brainchild of a former doctor, Jean-Paul Marat. After a string of unsuccessful careers, Marat found himself living in poverty, for a time finding shelter in the sewers of Paris. It was there he contracted a painful skin disease that now leaves him confined for long periods to a medicinal bath. A bitter and failed Marat finds in the revolution the perfect outlet for his venom. Jean-Paul Marat was just one of these professional malcontents. And unfortunately, revolutions do offer opportunity to professional malcontents. Marat took all of that bile, all of that resentment, and funneled it into a newspaper that became extraordinarily successful, L'Ami du Peuple. Marat was a man possessed of extraordinary anger. You just have to read the pages of his newspaper, The Friend of the People, to see this. In every issue, he displays a complete paranoid mentality. He sees plots everywhere. Everybody is plotting against the revolution, and the answer is very simple for him. The answer is blood. The answer is heads. Marat loathes the monarchy's relentless extravagance, even as poverty grips France and needs only the slightest rumor to lambast the king and queen in his newspaper. On October 2nd, 1789, his anger boils over. Word reaches Paris that the king has thrown a party at Versailles, that the decadent royals threw the new tricolor flag, symbol of the revolution, to the ground and trampled it underfoot. Marat is enraged. He reports the insult in his paper, just as a new threat breaks. The king has again ordered troops to move into positions around Paris. With the coup at the Bastille still smoldering in the minds of the people, Marat frantically urges them to take action. People of Paris, it's time to open your eyes! Shake yourselves out of your torpor! Wake up! Once more, wake up! October 5th, 
dawn breaks to the furious ringing of bells. Women gather near City Hall to protest the shortage of bread. And now, fear of the approaching royal troops mixes with anger as news of the king's offensive party circulates through the crowd. Soon, thousands are marching to Versailles, pikes and guns in hand. The women are taking their complaints to the king. The core of the crowd was made up of the famous poissarde, the fearsome fish ladies of the central markets who were known for their brawny build and their fearlessness. They were equipped with large knives for scaling fish. They were hugely muscular because they carted boxes. Uh, you didn't want to tangle with these ladies. These are women of the poor quarters. These are poor women which are affected by the increased price of bread, by the scarcity of products, who suddenly begin to realize that they must act. It is quite extraordinary how these ordinary women, probably most of them couldn't even write their name, suddenly act as the protagonists of the historical process. Inside the palace, word of the approaching crowd of angry women reaches the Queen's chambers. Legend has it, that it is at this moment that Marie Antoinette utters the most famous line she never said. Marie Antoinette did not say, let them eat cake. That is a myth. Marie Antoinette, unfortunately, probably never even noticed the poor people of her country long enough to make such a statement. As the mob of women gathers outside the gates, Louis understands that the revolution can no longer be ignored. It is being brought to his front door. He agrees to sign the Declaration of the Rights of Man, yet the crowd continues to grow throughout the night. By morning, 20,000 people are camped outside the royal palace. To close the centuries of distance between the king and his subjects, the angry mass demands that the king and queen move to Paris. Indecisive as ever, Louis is weak to respond. His hesitation would provoke a fury in the crowd and put the lives of the royal family in grave danger. When they don't get instant compliance with what they want, it really looks as if they're going to uh, massacre the queen. A wave of women break into the royal palace screaming for the blood of the queen. They massacre the guards, decapitate them, and impale their heads on pikes. They were like banshees screaming throughout the palace, give me her entrails, give me her head, I want a leg, I want an arm. I think that they had grown so frenzied that if they had encountered her, they probably would have torn her to pieces. Terrified for her life, Marie escapes to Louis' apartments only moments before the women break into her chambers and tear her bed to shreds. King and Queen are now at the mercy of the mob. And what the mob wants is a little attention from their king. The only way the women can be pacified is for the royal family to agree to go to Paris. Because once they're there in Paris, then they can ultimately be made to do what the people of Paris want. They march 60,000 strong, leaving Versailles with carts and wagons overflowing with flour from the king's storehouses flanking the royal carriage all the way to Paris. The king and queen were forced to go back to Paris with the heads of their guards, who had been massacred in the chateau. Their heads had been cut off. This is really a completely unbridled violence. The heads were then made up with makeup and paraded at the head of the cortege, with the king and queen following. The king and queen must make their new home in the Tuileries Palace. They will never see Versailles again. Once the royal family moves to Paris, they are the prisoners of Paris. They know it. Everybody else knows it. There are great limits to what they can do or even dream of doing. They are the prisoners of the capital city, there's no doubt. Versailles is abandoned and the assembly moves to Paris. Power is now with the people. France will have democracy, new laws, 
and a remarkable and unforgiving form of justice will make its debut on the revolutionary stage, the guillotine. May 1791. Nearly two years have passed since the royal family and the National Assembly have moved to Paris. Robespierre appears frequently at the Assembly and at the Jacobin Club, a debating society named for the former Jacobin Monastery where they gather. Now, words are the very core of the revolution, and Robespierre speaks with an unfailing moral compass. His true north is always the people. He soon earns the nickname, the incorruptible. France is now a constitutional monarchy, the king forced to share power with the revolutionaries in the assembly. But it seems Louis' share is growing smaller by the day, as he is forced to sign law after law diminishing his own authority, and that of the other great feudal regime, the Catholic Church. Louis decides the time has come to escape the confines of the new republic and mount a campaign to reclaim his kingdom. Louis had decided by 1791 that he needed to regain control of his country and he knew he could only do that with the help of a foreign army. So the idea was to make a break uh, from the Tuileries Palace and to head for the nearest border. June 21st, 1791. The king and queen disguise themselves as servants and by cover of darkness slip out from under the watchful eye of Paris. They make an ill-planned run for freedom. It is long past midnight when the royal family arrives in the small town of Varennes, some 100 miles east of Paris. They are close to the border of Austria, safety just a few miles away but their dash to freedom will go no further. Rumors of the royal's journey have preceded them to Varennes. A town official stops the carriage, demanding their passports. The official suspicions are confirmed. It is the signature of the king himself. The townsman is overcome at the sight of his king. But revolutionary guards nearby show no reverence for the fleeing royals. He keeps hoping that people will recognize him and there will be a kind of rebellion in his favor. And much to his horror and surprise, they are not ecstatic to recognize him. They see him as escaping and basically is arrested and taken back to Paris. The idea that the monarch had tried to abandon his people was psychologically catastrophic. That event really uh, broke the bond between Louis and his subjects. Now they had not only a king who was superfluous, they had a king who was obviously a traitor as well. With the royal family official turncoats to the revolution, power shifts from Louis, now a prisoner king, to the revolutionaries at the assembly. At the very heart of the young revolutionary government is Robespierre. He shines at the podium, calling for liberty, equality, and fraternity. He demands universal suffrage and an end to slavery in the French West Indies. And most passionately, he rails against the death penalty because in the new age of enlightenment, Robespierre wants to discard all remnants of the medieval past. Europe had inherited a macabre repertoire of execution techniques from the Dark Ages. Unremittingly cruel deaths by drawing and quartering, hanging, drowning, and burning at the stake. Well, under the old regime, there was a whole panoply of very gruesome punishments, and decapitation was punishment reserved for the nobility. And one of the things that the revolution wanted from the start was to have everybody equal in death. They wanted symbolically to have the same punishment available for anyone. Despite Robespierre's opposition, a new killing machine takes center stage in Paris. 
Physician inventor Joseph Ignace Guillotin devises a ruthless beheading machine, turning old-fashioned decapitation into a humanitarian experience. Dr. Guillotin describes his new device to the assembly. The mechanism falls like thunder. The head flies off, blood spurts. The man is no more. Always a supporter of bloodshed, the journalist Marat prints an enthusiastic rant in his paper, announcing the device's new name, Guillotine. It will soon earn a nickname, the National 